Start streaming. Okay then, that's fairly quick. Hello. Don't think there's anybody here yet, but uh, hey, and I am Chris from Air Windows doing my Monday live stream. And we are going to do coding today. So let me just uh, up two folks. Let's fiddle with my settings and things and get ready to roll. This is an interesting day because this is the day where I'm going to do a whole bunch of streaming. More than usual, because I'm working on getting that rolling. Let's see, chat window capture. There you go. I wonder whether maybe it would be cool to... Let's, let's play a track on my recording. I haven't done this before, but I saw somebody do it. I saw a guy called Vouch do this, but it was on a different type of stream. I'm going to put a uh, chroma key cap. Uh, and select black. and see whether I can't get uh, a transparent thing going on. So we'll see if that works. So yeah, this is a, a techie stream. And my thought was, it might be fun to code another plugin today. I've had various requests for stuff like that. The plugin that I put out on Sunday uh, was just Nicola. Hey, Bo. So I'm not sure how much needs to be talked about that. And oh, hey, my hair is already a green screen because it's going away. Um, I have a special magical green screen that only shows emojis. That's awesome. Okay, let's fool with this for a while. Science. Come to think of it, I wonder if I can do a Luma key. I can. Alrighty, so there we go. Honestly, the way this is going to work, and uh, yeah, I think I can be picked up here. I'm, I'm running all manner of stuff. Like, check it out. I can make my voice echo like this. Um, it's always about playing with the technology around here. And I can boost the gain on this up a little bit. Because when I'm coding, I'm going to be a little farther away from this. Or probably, anyhow. Let me see. It's all coming up with new things to do and new ways to do stuff. So I'm comfortable with that. It does make this experience kind of silly at times though. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm getting a, a mouse pad so that I can use the mouse. 
over there and I'm going to want to scooch the screen over. Uh, not currently showing it. I've been experimenting with all manner of stuff. So here's the current manner of stuff. Um, oh, I can make that go away. Um, hey, hey. We have a Luma key. See what Luma key does is it, um, and if I, well, if I do that, I can expand the words out a little bit too, because you can't see the edge of the screen anymore. I can run it over the whole damn screen. That might be amusing. Okay, that's enough fun. I should be able to see what I'm doing. What LumaKey is, is it um, lets you make certain things transparent. And in this case, what I'm doing is I'm making darkness and blackness transparent, which is not literally black, but close enough for all practical purposes. And since the uh, YouTube live chat window is a light on dark, if it was a black on white, I could use the inverse Luma key and make white go. Um, and this is this is relevant because this is something that I'm going to be fooling with on uh, music streams because that's where I'm getting the uh, graphical effects out of that uh, Sleepy Circuits Hypno over there. I should scooch this microphone closer. So Miles is asking, do I have interest in helping analog synth plugins moving forwards in lushness and harmonics? Absolutely. Absolutely. I am not coding analog synth plugins myself, mostly because the templates that I use for uh, audio plugins aren't synthesizer or MIDI templates. So that's something I haven't mastered. And there could come a time when I pick that stuff up, but it wasn't today and it wasn't yesterday. I don't know how to code a synth plugin. There are examples out there. So, and one challenge with synth plugins is often you need to build a kind of interface just because the number of controls are a little bit fancier. Like uh, you can see the number of controls on my synth over there, or the Moog underneath it still has, let me go and count. Thirty-two controls on a monophonic synthesizer. So this is one reason why I don't have, um, synthesizer plugins so much is one, I don't know how to do it. And two, doing it up properly requires a really huge number of controls, unless it would be more about just coding stuff. Oh, hello. Huh. My viewer numbers here in the stream settings are going crazy. No problem. Only real reason I have to keep track of that is to, uh, if I have anything fancy happening so that I can set it up or kind of announce it. Oh, another side note, um, what I was doing on the Nicola video is I actually have a reverb running on my voice mic now since I record through uh, my full rig, basically. So if I turn that up, this is what the reverb is that I'm using on the voiceover. And you can see it's a um, 
distinct kind of sound. Turn it back down. I can actually crank it even more by doing this. And I pick this for a voiceover reverb. Because it's short and it's gated, it stops it. Um, I have all the other bigger reverbs available too, but this is for just running the mic through and I'm continuing to try to raise my game as far as doing this kind of stuff. So I'm seeing more questions come through. Some of the questions are a little bit difficult to see overlaid over my screen, but that's fine. No biggie. So actually, I think I can fix that. Let me fool with this. Always got to be fooling with it. Yeah, my viewer accounts are going crazy. It's like everybody is disappearing and reappearing rapidly. See, what I'm doing now is I went from the Luma key, which is taking out black like this, and instead I'm going to a control that's called uh, Luna Min Smooth, because this does a partial transparency, and that's useful for things like my graphics that I do on the live streams. But in this case, what I can do is sneak this up And doing that, I can fade the background under it so that uh, like if I take the Luma Min and raise it up enough, it's always going fully transparent. But if I partially darken it, Then I can have a sort of semi-transparent under here. And uh, interestingly, the there's an area on the screen that is fully black, even though other, well, maybe it's not. We can find out. Nope, there is no area on the screen that's fully black. It only looked like it because there wasn't anything to this side of what you're seeing is uh, darkness as one side of the whatever mixing visual. Yep, that's what we're doing. So I will I will move on towards the um, coding streaming uh, soon, but I'm just fooling around with it so that the display on the screen was looking respectable. Um, So Zachary was mentioning a thing like an analog sense that responds to the audio waveform. I have tried that. I have tried that. However, uh, it's not as easy as you'd think. You're kind of doing a face locked looped kind of thing. And then it's making a synth and it becomes an issue similar to what I was talking about with the Moog of how many knobs do you want on it and can they all be sliders? Because I'm still doing stuff without uh, interfaces for simplicity purposes and having the plugins be uh, low overhead and small. Like I've got over 100 plugins in a 70 meg download because they only have code and only op operate based on code and text and sound. Squirmdini also has a question. Uh, by all means, post plugins to JSFX. They are MIT licensed, meaning all you have to do is um, credit me in some way. Say that they're Air Windows. MIT license is so permissive that I'm not sure you necessarily have to open your own source because it's not viral in the way that the GPL would be. And it's commercial friendly, so you can take stuff and then sort of rehack it and resell it if you want. The thing is, if you are a um, 
if you're trying to resell something that you got from me, I can always undercut it because my stuff is free. So you might not be well advised to try that, but Ghost on a Trampoline says, is there a danger in using two monitoring on the two bus? Not really. The issues with something like that are not severe. Like, I'm not quite sure why you'd want to use L or add into CAN C, but suppose you did. Um, dithering to 24 bit is not going to be really a problem. That's not going to give you issues to speak of. So let's go ahead if you want. Um, if you're doing a 16 bit output, you'd be doing that last. Uh, Zachary, you're suggesting um, a synth that's track. It's basically you're making an envelope follower in some fashion. Yeah, you're talking about bit depth. You probably mean amplitude. We could try making something. I mean, I have, like, I keep working on my visuals and stuff, but I still don't have audio patched through this. I still don't have audio patched through this. Nor do I have my picture-in-picture -picture as a more useful side. In theory, that's something that I should be able to do, but I don't have it yet. <laughs> JavaScript FX. So you're talking about making audio code in the browser. I've seen a bunch of neat stuff being done with JavaScript, so that's fine. I guess, sure, why not? Uh, give it a shot. So here's the thing. And let's go back here. I'm going to start coding a plugin out of my sheaf of possible things that we could do because I've been building up some things. I know, I think Andy, Ahmed, Said, Anand there uh, was asking for me to code something from scratch, which is an interesting request. And that's not always what I do. There's a number of variations I need to work on existing plugins that I need to put out as distinct things. I was watching a dude that goes by the Daydream Sound on YouTube, and he was demonstrating resampling using an old Akai sampler, which was very interesting to me because I listened to what he was doing and I went, oh my God, this old Akai sampler is essentially doing like glitch shifter without intelligence. The resampling that it had was so primitive, so primitive, that it wasn't even interp it wasn't even smoothing its loop. It was just <laughs> as a fixed frequency. And that's even harsher than glitch shifter. So I had an idea for calling one glitch nasty. That would involve going into glitch shifter and stripping stuff out of it until it was smaller, simpler, more efficient, and keeping the name uh, glitch related so that they would be next to each other in the list. And if you had that one in there, you'd be able to pick between Glitch Shifter or Glitch Nasty, which would, rather than doing the, the pitch shift and smoothly interacting or interpolating, it would just sort of buffer smash it. And there'd be a real grind to it. But the thing about that is, unlike the Akai, that Daydream Sound was demonstrating. Glitch Nasty lets you set the tightness. It lets you set how big the buffer is. So you could tune it. And you could tune it to a note. You could tune it to any number of things. Could be handy. It would certainly be a weird, aggressive effect. I've also had somebody ask me for a fixed flange effect, although technically you could use ombre 
and that's fairly similar to trying to do a fixed flange effect. But I'm looking through my, my notes, and I'll just read off of some of these. There are a number of things. For instance, I could, I've could i also got a, I've got some cab things from back in the day that I need to do. Uh, cab SVT, the cabs plugin, which is a bear because it's kind of like pocket verb. It's a huge pile of code because it involves switching a lot of things around. And that's not necessarily friendly. It's not necessarily desirable. Um, basically, it means any given thing that you're running, you've also got 12 times as much code sitting around, not being used, but eating up memory. And I don't like coding stuff like that. So it might be worth, I've been resisting doing cabs for that reason, that it has that switch in it. And you're picking one or another of these models, and then the other ones are just sitting there unused anytime that you've got it. The inefficiency of that doesn't sit well with me. And then I've also got an acoustic bass, which is based on the same concept. They're all essentially little convolution plugins. They're all basically the same thing, except for that since my plugins don't refer to the file system or talk to the computer at all, that means that um, if I have a convolution plugin, it can't load files off the hard drive or SSD or whatever it is that you use. And not doing that is another way in which the plugins are able to work around things like, I don't know, macOS Gatekeeper and so on, since they're not trying to do anything beyond what they're given they're less likely to break in various ways or run into problems when the computer is trying to run security features and not let you have certain things. So let's talk about some of the possibilities that we could do today, because that's what I'm doing now. I've, I've revised some of the stuff that I'm doing where going forward, 11 o'clock means I'm going to code stuff and answer questions like this. And it's going to look and act like this. And certainly also today, but on other days as well, if it so happens. Three o'clock, I'm going to do music jams, but I'm going to do it in a particular way where I've got, I think I mentioned this on, uh, this is the little lavalier mic that I used to have. If I unplug my good mic, and plug this in instead. I'm patched into the input that I use for uh, bass on my music. And then the volumes and stuff I've got it set to. If I switch in the mic and uh, switch off the pad, I believe is what I'll also have to do. This little lav is not as so loud that it would feed back even though it's coming through the speakers, like everything else, when I'm doing a live music jam. Like right now I have the speakers switched off, they would feedback like crazy, this mic is very sensitive. This one not so much. So what I do is, if I switch the mic in, have it hooked up, take the pad off, and cup it in my hand like it was a harmonica, and talk directly into it, I can hit it with a high enough out uh, level that I can be heard through the mix, or I can pick up the mic and talk into the chat. And so that is something I've never done before, which is be able to do my music stuff that I did uh, for, geez, a couple of years. Never got much attention, but I did it for a couple of years on this basis of I'm never listening to anybody's suggestion and I don't want to talk to anybody. You're just watching. I'm done with doing that. Instead, I'm going to do it kind of like uh, a guy that I'm a fan of, Colin Benders, typically does this, where he's doing his jams, but then when he's finished, he picks up a mic and he talks to chat. I've never done that, and that's probably what's hurting people wanting to be around and paying attention to it, and it seems like a fine time to start. Now that said, and I assume I don't have to scroll this window... 
No. Right now, people are just listening to what I... Mm. Either that or I've chased everybody away. You know, that's the risk that you run. We'll just see. I think I need to have this visible so that I can tell whether I've got the computer screen. So for for those of you that are here, let's pick a project. This is the first in several where I am going to, not only that, as long as I'm distracted by images of myself on the screen, let us just, um, get this going and many images of me all over the screen to distract my attention. And let's pick a project for working on in the live coding as we do. So here's a possibility. I was going to do some work on a fancy reverb. That might be too big a project, although it would be closer to starting from scratch, really. I know that uh, Andy wanted me starting from scratch. I've got a note guitar, bright ambience instead of IR. That's still adapting various things to each other. Here's one about um, Olympic Helios uh, consoles. There's some detail on how the EQs and things work. That's relevant to some of the stuff that I'm doing, but it might be a big project for talking through uh, Righteous 3, people want a version of Righteous 3. People want a, well, actually, you know, one person wanted test tone sweep and also the possibility for a test tone at 997 hertz. And that is, in fact, something that I could do to, uh, from scratch. So I don't see I don't see chat moving. I guess we'll have to run the risk of that. Uh, but yeah, if you, I'm going to try to decide uh, what to code here, bringing chat in because that's something that it seems like I'm uh, missing out in not doing. So there was somebody asking for a test tone sweep. Hmm. Uh, and I'm beginning to see chat. Um, somebody was asking for a bass fart monitor test. Uh, I could dig up one of the other amps. Like I have um, bass amp as I was working with last week. That should be coming soon. Here's an idea for a uh, a gentler point plugin that's more preset. That is not really from. I'm, I'm looking on things on the basis of whether they're sufficiently like coding it from scratch. Because I know Andy was asking for that, although honestly, doing this live coding stuff, it's more useful to take stuff and adapt it because there's going to be plenty for me to say. Uh, here's an idea for one called Edge, which is energy using parallel bands. That's that's tricky. I'm not sure if I'd be able to do that. Oh, hello. Here's a possibility. Here is a capacity for a square wave tremolo that uses zero crossings so that it will cut in and out in a smooth way similar to some of my modular stuff. I've got a set of VCAs over there. It's the WMD uh, devices, DVCA. And the whole point of those is that you can make them turn on or off at zero crossings. So if you were rapidly doing that, then it's not going to click as much. There's a distinct quality to this. And this might be something that we could do. 
from scratch, because I don't have anything quite resembling that, that we can do fast enough that you can hear a result, even if it's only over these speakers, because as yet, I still don't have a way of patching it through so that I have the direct output. Like, I have a way of patching the headphone out into the video switcher and setting levels on that, which I could do if I worked at it, but then I wouldn't be able to hear what I was doing. Oh, I think we're starting to get... Yeah, and then there was a more complicated one, Move, which was a dead mouse style timing messing, which isn't necessarily what he even does, but I need to expand seriously. I need to do a seriously two, which lets you crank out the side level because that turns out to be something that the hardware unit does. That could be for another time. People are asking me for a sample delay. That's another thing. The amps, I've got those sitting there waiting to be done. I've got a fancy, I'm not quite sure what this meant. <laughs> it's something. AD clip, but combine adjacent samples. I don't quite know what that means. And the old, uh, yeah, Bodenarius will lose his mind. The base sorting plugin. That's for another day. That should definitely do that on stream, even if it turns out to be. So let me set some of these aside as crowd-pleasing attempts. Here's one for um, a console that offsets the shape of the behavior so that it has more second harmonic in it. The golden dither. Focus, but as a compressor using the curve or recurve. Uh, a request for more code on the chord organs. Actually, I needed to do that, so I'll put that aside. Oh, here's an idea for Air Windows Dark Noise using dither noise, but summing it out of a series of bins and randomly eh, it's a weird concept which probably would work it would be a weird kind of thing i think i have my answer already though but yep somebody wanted the gate out of c strip that would be a Likely example for how to get stuff out of more large and elaborate stuff. Here's my resample code. The new the new concept. Bowden areas. I assume it's Denarius. But uh, oh god. I'm gonna have to go and kill that. Excuse me. I had that machine on for the specific purpose of talking to people from whom I am getting the order of firewood. I have firewood being delivered tomorrow, and I'm going to be carrying firewood all day long, so that's going to be exhausting. But my phone is not a useful thing because it's bombed by telemarketers and, and criminals all the time. So I'm going to go and turn the answering machine on back off now. Put it away. Yeah, kind of tragic. This morning I was thinking actually about the way in which the my YouTube commitments have kind of eroded and dropped back until it's like, okay, I put a plug in every week and I show up on Monday for a Q&A every week and I'm enhancing that, but everything else is eroded because I've had so much stuff going on. Like, here's a new thing. I have my replacement wood stove that came in over the last week. So I had to have people in here installing the thing, which took up an entire day. They were there late morning and 
sort of the way my bizarre autistic brain works, I was up at like four and couldn't sleep and couldn't do anything because the entire morning I was waiting for these people to arrive because I knew that was going to happen. It was like, people are going to arrive, people are going to arrive. And uh, I'm basically exploring how to handle a heavier workload with air windows and my various commitments. And one of the things that happens is if a, if a commitment is something like I'm going to jam on my synthesizer and stream it and like I'm getting heckled or having problems or something like that, that can drop away because it's not being pulled forward by people asking for it and putting it back becomes a whole elaborate thing. So let's see, let's put some of these aside. I'm starting far too late to do the uh, bass sort thing, even with the buffer smashing sounding terrible version, which I have in mind. Because I feel I, like, um, I think I worked out a way to do that, given that I was going to have a buffer but wasn't going to be able to figure out how to do it properly. So I could do it in small localized areas and have glitches and nastiness, which is not at all what I wanted. I'm deeply unsatisfied with that. But it, what I did end up having a code that would do something. It wasn't going to do what I imagined. It wasn't going to do what I talked about, but it was going to at least do something. Trouble is that I'm not going to have enough time to do that. I was talking about what I was uh, committing to, and one of the things that I did in changing all this stuff around is I took away those numbers on the wall because I'm no longer going to restrict it to the uh, number of minutes correlated to how big the Patreon is because the Patreon is getting smaller and going away. And so I'm not comfortable with just cutting back people's time. So instead, I'm just going to go for like a couple hours and maybe on days when I'm really fried or don't have the time, I'll go for shorter. And it's just going to become a little bit more organic, a little bit more flexible. And what I was going to do here, I can tell you the story about this. Yet another project. Pick this up. Oh, now where the hell did I put the thing? Dang it. Well, I think I just threw it away. The remaining bits. I went and I bought one of these at a art store. This is a clock. The guts of a clock, except for that I took it apart because I broke it, and I'll tell you the whole story. But for the time being, I bought a clock kit where you're supposed to you know, take the hands and things and build whatever clock face or clock structure it is that you're going to do. And it's a wall clock for you. It's the kind that ticks very quietly and that has relevance to this story. And I decided what I was going to do is get a contraption together where I could have the multiple hands on the clock and one of them and this this relates to the changing the time around from committing to you know an hour and x minutes tied to how big the patreon is and streaming music jamming for that long I can go as long as I want essentially but I've also experimented with other ideas and if I'm going to let people into the process and be able to talk to people while getting warmed up, that opens things up for setting up a thing where I have a clock and it sits on the wall where the numbers used to be. So it'll show on the cameras and stuff. You'll be able to see it, but I'll be able to see it. And I can just turn it around so that it starts off at like vertically 
there will be no numbers, but it'll go. Actually, that's going counterclockwise, isn't it? It'll go. And I'll be able to see at what point, like I'm half an hour in, or if I go for an hour or 70 minutes, those times relate to different output formats. For instance, around 24, 25 minutes or so is the side of a vinyl record. And if I go for a little over an hour, or like uh, 65, 70 minutes or so, that's a CD. And with my uh, dithers and word length reducers, I can manufacture CDs that actually sound pretty respectable so long as I downsample them properly. There's a number of ways to do that. I like to use this program called Brick, which is a, a Mac program. But there's PC programs of equal quality. Basically, if you're doing a sample rate conversion, you should really be doing it in offline processing. You should be doing a uh, sample rate conversion where it's like some separate program and it just goes like, okay, infinite size um, brick wall filter calculation. Because basically the way that stuff works is either hardly process at all or way over process so much that it's ridiculous. Intermediate measures don't sound as good. You can do sample rate conversion in some cases where if you're not going to run into a lot of aliasing, like if you have a fairly dark track, you can simply throw some averagings on and further soften the extreme highs and then just directly chop it and get a functional, decent sounding result. If you're using semi-complicated processing, you start getting artifacts up in the extreme highs. But then if you get the completely overwhelming, crazy running offline processing, where it's running at like, you know, in a modern computer, it's still doing only about quarter natural speed. That can give you a measurement of um, how to calculate the brick wall filter that's using a buffer that's like two minutes long. And it's incorporating all of those uh, values, probably at fairly high resolution. And that's what I use Brick for. There's also offline processors in the Windows realm that I don't know specifically what they are, but they do exist, where you can take your 96K or whatever content and run it through that and get a high resolution, but 44.1K that really does a damn good job of handling the highs cleanly, completely eliminating all aliasing because you're just over processing like mad. And that would mean being able to do a legitimate uh, CD style format, which would mean if I designed something where I was doing jams and watched the clock so that I kept the jam at a CD length, it would be a way to sort of jazz like improvise something that ends up being like, yep, I just did a record. I just did an album rather than I just did three hours of random unprocessed streaming. Because part of it is if I was getting like rather than trying to make all the streaming be music, if I was getting uh, together and chatting with chat and answering questions about the gear and whatever and going like, okay, here's the stuff that I'm doing. What would be good? Are people in the mm -hmm. mood for like an ambient piece? You'd like it to sound particularly dark. If I'm gonna play a guitar, I just changed guitar strings the other day as well. Um, is more of a stratty or a, a Gibson-y thing uh, feel right for you today? and just get that kind of direction and then go and do the improvisation but for not as long of a time and stop it and go back to talking to people again. And here's where the clock thing gets more complicated because the clock has a minute hand and an hour hand. I built this in here, I'll tell you, 
I built this entire thing up, implemented the entire concept, pretty much got it all the way through to where it was an actual functioning thing, and then decided I was going to power the clock off of the batteries I was setting up for making control voltages, at which point I hit the clock machine with 9 volts by accident and killed it permanently. So now I have to go and buy another one. But here's what I was trying to do. Take the clock, which will turn a minute hand so I can see what that is, and you can see that it shows up against the black. This black, which is very nicely black on this uh, recording, is black 2.0 from Stuart Semple. And Stuart Semple is a guy after my own, my own heart who makes paints and things. He, he's in the UK and he makes paints based on his resentment and rebelliousness against people who are using technology in art to prevent people from having access to tools. So he started making these paints because there's a guy uh, Mitch Kapoor, something like that, um, who got all the rights to using uh, the black technology, Vanta Black, in art. And the guy successfully got all rights to do that. And so Stuart started coming up with other blacks and selling them. And the condition on their use is you can't be this other guy or let him have any of it. And he's been doing that sort of spite-ridden uh, invention ever since. So I got some of his paints. As you can see, this is a pretty good black. It, it's very black against the screen. Um, so you could see the hand, the, the surface of this, this is, this is me talking through all of my invention stuff to the point where people run screaming. That's okay. We'll just live with it. This is projection screen material. The other side of it is a... Uh, you can see where the hand is, and it's super glued onto this projection screen material, which is a sort of vinyl. And the white side of it is that reflective stuff. Yeah, the paint guy's name is Stuart Semple. In fact, I'll show you another thing that I've got from him. I think you can still get this. See? Stuart Semple. This is a watercolor kit. This is what I've been using for some of my camera tests. You can see uh, I set this one up specifically for the purpose of calibrating these cameras. So what you're seeing right now is all of these colors contained within this kit. And I made little swatches of all of them like rather than being just in the tubs there, this is those colors on paper at the highest intensity that I could get. Because what I do is I take a picture using the camera and then I construct a lookup table where I've adjusted the tone of all of these compared to holding up the little pan against the screen and looking at what the actual paint looks like relative to what it looks like in the picture that I took. Back in the day, I had a, uh, a Panasonic GH5 camera. And it was quite interesting, because with that one, when you start hitting it with these uh, super intense watercolor pigments, the physical pigments of really high quality paint can go way beyond the gamut of what your computer can record or what your camera can do. So I'm doing that on purpose and kind of trying to set it up so that I can adjust the details of which colors, which hues go in which directions. And 
Yeah, Stuart Temple. So here's what I was doing with this invention. I swear to God, I'm not even doing any coding today. Whatever. There are going to be some days when I'm just scrambled. Especially as I start streaming more. Especially as I start doing the music and stuff more. And my days start filling up. And this is a weird historical time anyhow, so we're all kind of losing our minds, I think. But... Um, I'm going to be very scrambled sometimes. I think this is a particular time when I'm unusually scrambled, and hopefully I'll get better. But if I don't, people can just live with it. If you get the clock thing and assemble it like this, you have the moving hand, and these are meant to lay down flat. Uh, the moving hand is shaped in this way so they go over those wires. The minute hand says how long you've gone, but this is connected to, if I can get the bugger out, can't really see it super well, but this small golden thing in there is the bit that connects to the hour part, which is this plastic bit, this white plastic bit here. You screw the minute hand on using this, and then the hour part's a press fit on this, and I've got it glued into a laminate, which is a cottage cheese container top. It's, it's meant to be flat. It didn't work out flat, so I'm going to have to solve that. And simple paper. And here's why. You can see that I've got the inside painted black because I want the minute hand to show up against it. But I've also got these wires all over this and I haven't explained what those are for. Here's what that's for. And I got it all wired up too. It's just not functioning yet. If I have this as an hour hand, and these with the little wires here, you can see there's two wires going to it. Position them just right so that they're flat pressing down the edge of this paper thing. I can have the multiple wires squishing against the paper. If I have one of these leads, as I have, wired to a battery, this is two 9-volt batteries in series, giving me 18 volts. Actually, when I measured it, I was getting way more than 18 volts. I don't exactly know why that is, but it was giving me like 30 volts. And then the wire coming back goes to one of these jacks, connecting these two together for any of these positions makes the jack output short to a battery power of like about 30 volts. Then you get a graphite pencil. And you start filling in areas as if like this. If you have your two wires being dragged across the surface of the paper and the two wires get dragged across the area where pencil is, that shorts the wires together to some extent. So you have a very slow speed sequencer. And that's what I was building when I broke the clock module and had to take it all apart and I need to build it again once I get one that's not broken. Although one thing about it, I got a lot of weird little gears and things out of it. So that was a day of work wasted. If it was not wasted, it would be already mounted. So I think I've done here when I shorted the wires of the graphite. 
Not to your headphones, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I think it was just accident. Let's do it again and find out. So if these wires that are connected to a battery and as the circle of paper is rotated around by the hour hand of the clock, and one thing about it is that it has a pretty good amount of torque because it's geared down so much, the uh, wires get dragged across these areas and how widely you set them up also depends upon what you're going to get. It's never going to be an exact short, although you could take a piece of aluminum tape and stick it on and that would give you an exact short. That would give you the full voltage of whatever it was. But to some extent, if you're shading stuff in with the graphite pencil, that means you also get to do varying amounts. It's just going to be kind of weird and uncontrolled. I've already tried this, for instance. These two ones. I used a lot of pressure to fill this one in. And so what it's going to do is when the wires are dragged across this, it's going to be about, I don't know, 10K, maybe a little bit less. Even with a fair bit of distance, as long as you use enough pressure, you'll make a resistance that um, a good black graphite line will carry voltage. But if you do this light line here, sometimes you can have a light line that's clearly visible, but it doesn't carry any voltage. It's really not dense enough. There's a threshold point somewhere where you're filling it in and the graphite pieces start to touch each other enough that they carry electricity. So the thing is, if you're doing that, you're going to get a somewhat eccentric and variable voltage out of it at the same time. And the way I've got it set up, not that I have the clock parts because I broke that by mistake. Here's what I, what I did. I was trying to run a resistor between the high voltage here and the 1.5 volts that the clock thing needs. And the resistor wasn't doing anything and I tried a potentiometer, and the potentiometer was giving me weird results on the multimeter. I was using these and fiddling with them. These are very cheap. These, these are the ones that I was able to get as a full reel, so they're like five cents, which is very cheap for this type of thing. And I wired it up and tried to see whether I could get a consistent voltage, but it was flickering. It was being a very low voltage, and then sometimes I would be, suddenly it's 30 or something, I'm like, I don't get what's going on. Maybe it's just confusing me. Why don't I hook it up to the clock motor and see if I can make it work? And almost immediately it's like, put, did I just hear a noise? That was very faint. That, that might have been the noise of the thing dying. And sure enough, it was gone. And now I got to replace it. But um, essentially the way this, this works is if I can successfully make it uh, be a thing, not only do I have my clock hand showing where I am in the measurement of roughly an hour, and I can decide like, do I want to think in terms of vinyl records and time things to be like 25 minutes or less, or do I want to think in terms of CDs and time things to be a little over an hour? I'll also have areas for four different CV outputs, all of which will be consistent with each other each time I do it. And yeah, Bo's got a good point there. A three pin volts regulator would do it. And it is a three hour sequence because this moves really, really slowly. It's the hour hand. It's got plenty of torque. I'm sure it can pull a piece of paper past like eight separate wire contacts, but it'll move very, very slowly. 
so I can do a kind of designed thing where and it'll all be completely battery powered and this drywall screw is to bolt it onto the wall where the numbers used to be. Day of work, day of work doing this and I have nothing because the bit broke, but sometimes that's how that rolls. Let's take, let's go in, into the coating. I, I did promise coating. I know I'm very scattered and part of that is because I got a bunch of stuff going on today. The reason the phone went off is because I had the uh, the answering machine functioning rather than just switched off entirely. And that's because I had to pay for a load of firewood that's going to come in tomorrow. So I had that to do. And I got, yeah, it's a mechanical sequencer with a CV out, with four CV outs. That's exactly what it is. And uh, I have hopes of being able to make that do something, but over to the coding. And again, I also have not changed my picture in picture. I'm sure that there's a way of telling the ATEM Mini to do this, but I haven't done it yet because I haven't had time. There's never time. Let's do something from scratch. Let's do the zero crossing thing from scratch. I'm going to run Xcode and go new project. And that is AU unit effect. I'm going to do it as an AU. And I'm not worried about doing it um, in stereo yet. In this instance, my choice of going to Cocoa View is instead going to Stereo Build. But I'm going to do this. And what's a good name for a zero crossing square wave tremolo? I think maybe I'll just have to think of one because I'm too rambly today and I'm scaring everybody away, but whatever. It's going to be a square wave tremolo with a frequency setting and probably a dry wet. It's got nothing to do with Mojo, so... It will sound a little bit like a motor. Um, I would like to use Trem for... Maybe Tremel Square? Finish all the coffees. Tremel Square. <laughs> Coffee tremors. Tremo zone. Sure. And I'm not going to buy capitalize it. Sometimes that's useful. Maybe it would even be useful this time. I do have a bunch of stuff. Sure, let let I will buy capitalize it. Why not? It starts with tremo anyhow, so that's fine. So here's what we got. Uh, don't drag that part. So this is starting from scratch. This is what I get when I use my template and build something on the audio unit template. And I can open this up in various places. Here's one of the things I'm going to have to do something about. And you'll note that I've made the um, text huge because I felt that it was unreadable before. So I'm going to see whether I can't uh, position stuff like here. And in the audio unit format, you need to specify a comp subtype. 
and a comp menf. Comp menf is who you are as a developer. Like I've reserved the uh, letters DTHR, which of course stands for dither because of course I would be using that as my manufacturer name. So DTHR is Air Windows. Comp subtype has to be a unique identifier for the plugin. And considering how many of these I have, that can be challenging, but I base it off of the name, meaning that generally I don't have any overlaps. You do get a large number of possibilities. I like to use all lowercase, although some lowercase identifiers are reserved for Apple, but um, I've habitually used just lowercase. And so that limits it somewhat, but there's no overlap because I'm using the name of the plugin. I also have a technique where I start using numbers for my numbered versions. So first let's, TRSQ is going to be a Tremel squares identifier. You gotta pick something to do with that. It'll save that. And then if I did Tremel square two or Tremel square three, it would start becoming this. Tremel square two or TSQ two maybe, or Tremel square three. And that's how I do those variations when I start continuing to increase that. That or there have also been times when I've done something a little weirder. And a number of my ID numbers use this. If I was gonna do a Tremel square two, I would start incrementing. So QRS, that would be Tremel square, except for adding one to the letter. So it would be TRSR. Generally, I've been able to get away with doing that, but using numbers is also probably a good idea. Don't have to worry about that right now. Going over to Tremel square H. You can't see it because it opened in the wrong part of the screen. But in, in the larger, here, check this out. This is what I had before. Now you can't see that very well, but uh, it gives me more space. Uh, my brother Dan always complained about this, that I was using too small of a font. Um, the reason this is not working on streaming is because to stream, I have to use a mirrored output, and the mirrored output is going to um, either 1600 by 900 or something. There's just any, any number of ways in which this can not go well. And doing it with the uh, 1080i, which is what it was set up previously, was upsampling in order to then downsample, and then it became a big mess. Um, this was my non big font. So I've spent a fair bit of time coding this way, but I can't stream that because you can't read any damn thing that it says. So we'll go back to Troll Gray's huge. And now you can see what it says. This is another People who code run into this stuff a lot, like uh, you can have your various different ways of doing things. And uh, Dan would always give me a hard time because um, I'd be using this really small font because I needed to see things on the same screen. I needed to keep track of stuff. And when you get to become a professional programmer and start to handle really large things, you start having to encapsulate them and keep them in little pieces of code. And it's all about keeping it all in your head so you don't have to see it all on the screen. I typically like being able to see more of it on the screen because I like to not bury everything in abstractions. I like to see pretty much everything that's gonna be working as code in one place. That's not always what you want, though. In any case, let's go after this Tremel square thing. And what I'm going to do right away is remove some of these things, because I know I'm going to want to. And I'm going to be renaming these uh, 
control names. And this is where we get a control name in the audio unit. So our first control is going to be the frequency that we use. And I'm going to have the default value, which is this, be 0 0.5, and the default dry wet to be 1. I might actually be referring to other plugins just to get a sense of uh, what frequencies I can use. And we're also going to go here and take these out and say number of parameters equals 2. This is all part of how we set up these sliders. It's the same kind of thing as if you had uh, knobs, except for that if you were specifying knobs programmatically in something like juice or whatever, it's an even bigger pile of mess as far as figuring out what happens where. This, I don't really know anybody who's doing a knob system that you can sort of visually set up. I have a lot of experience in stuff like Photoshop or whatever, but the the knob systems in GUI toolkits never seem to work that way. They're never approachable in that way. They're always an enormous pile of mess. I don't know why. I guess it's just if you are able to do this kind of thing, you have no respect for other people's process, and so everything has to work your way. Some side notes here. Up here, we've got some virtual float 64s. It's get tail time and get latency. I don't have these in uh, VST. Tail time means when you've shut off the plugin, how long does it continue to process output? And latency, of course, is how many samples, or it's in seconds, so how many seconds does your plugin delay the sound? And if you declare latency here, which I typically never do, it will delay all the other plugins in the project to keep up. That's one reason why I tend to avoid using it, is because it'll kill the interactivity of your mix, because you won't be able to record into it, because you have built-in latency for everything in your mix, because you've declared a plugin that runs latency. Here is where we specify something like private, and the FPD is part of my uh, dithering to floating point code, and it can also be used as a random number, because that's what it will be doing in practice. So we're going to go float64, and I think if we're going to... I'm going to need a Boolean in here as well. This is this is what it's like doing something from scratch, essentially. Um, so float64 is the um, oscillator built into this. I'm coming up with a name for the oscillator. Let's call it osc, seeing as that's what it is. And then Boolean, which is a logic thing, it's a true or false. I wonder whether that is, I'll call it. I'll call Boolean positive. That's going to be whether the signal is in the positive swing or not. And it'll cross over based on this. So I've got these two variables now declared. That means I can go elsewhere and start actually using them. But not before I fix some of this. You can see that uh, these are not blue. Oh, it's in the wrong place. Let me move it. That's because these are no longer relevant. I've removed all this stuff, so it wouldn't actually work this way. So we're taking those out. And same deal here. Some of this stuff is not showing up in blue because it's not really a thing. This is also why I use smaller um, fonts is so that I can see everything in something like this. So 
So let's select these and make these go away too. I go all the way down to default, which continues to be there, and now this is much smaller too. The tremolo is most definitely not going to tempo sync with the DAW. It's going to be almost like a musical note. You can have it uh, doing that sort of David Bowie and the Diamond Dogs album thing where it's causing a, a note style effect because at this higher, at the zero crossing behavior, it'll be less grating when you do that. Also, I have no way of telling what the DAW is doing regarding tempo. I don't know what the input would be for that. So there's no chance of it tempo sticking with the DAW. And having answered that question, I have to go back to this again and see what it was that I said it was. So OSC and positive. So we got overall scale in here, and then we got a bunch of this stuff that we don't need. So these are going to be deleted. This never actually ended up being relevant. In fact, I can update this on the fly by edit all in scope. So this was a variable that was not necessary. The way this works is uh, you're declaring variables. It's good practice to do it in the area that you're working. I didn't used to do that, so I have all the variables declared up top outside of the loop. And you don't necessarily want to have extra variables running around. Modern processors are able to do math calculations faster than looking up another variable. So rather than calling something dry and having it be the inverse of wet, I just do the calculation every time. And selecting it here, or let's see here, if I select a thing and then go edit all in scope, you can see that it's selecting both of these. This is an old version of uh, Xcode, and this is how this one does this. Generally, all this stuff does things in all different ways and it's really daunting and impossible until you start getting familiar enough with enough of it that you start recognizing how that stuff goes like you go well usually you can rename everything that's a variable in scope meaning in the context like in another program it's not going to rename the slider to in another program so you look for the way that it does it and i am Right-clicking, and indeed, you can select the thing. That said, what we're doing here is just deleting all of this stuff. Because we're not using any of that, but we're probably using overall scale because we're going to want the frequency of what we're doing to be um, relative to the sample rate. Like if we've got it set to a like 20 hertz tone of a tremolo and we went to 96K, we might just want it to also be a 20 hertz tone there. And it probably will cause aliasing if you tremolo at audio frequencies, but we don't care because we're trashing the sound so aggressively anyhow that it wouldn't matter. And we are also not going to be cutting into or out of a sound while it's underway. So we're always going to be switching from silence to sound or sound to silence at a zero crossing. And that's going to change everything. So let's start doing a thing. We got our dry sample. We've got this stuff. We're going to keep the dry wet control. And this is, is this is our entire processing loop right here. Like right now, this is all of it. The uh, entire thing fits into this. And in fact, the only thing we're doing right now is a dry wet control without having changed anything. 
So I'm going to make this go back again. And now it's time to do something with OSC and positive, probably first OSC. So let's see. Firstly, our overall scale is one, but it's larger if it is um, a higher sample rate. So this is going to relate to Here's how we make something be a frequency. In fact, let's make it be a frequency. Let's literally do a frequency. We'll play it back over the laptop and you'll clearly hear it. There's our output. Now, how are we updating it? It's going to start out as zero. What we're going to do is make it increase to a point and then wrap, but we're going to increase it this way. We're going to call this increment instead of gain because it's no longer a gain control. And osc plus equals increment. And then we're going to want to wrap that around. So This is going to make a oscillator. It's going to be a uh, sawtooth, and it's going to be only positive. It's going to go from zero to positive one, which is the like zero dB in the DAW. Positive one is clipping on the DAW. It'll go from positive one to negative one. We're not worrying about negative one. We're only going to go to positive one, and we're going to scale it by now I don't have anything else in here in this parenthesis yet and that is because get parameter one is already giving me a number so what's going to happen is this number is going to make a oscillator that's incredibly high pitched and it will alias like mad but this is going to make a sound now this, this problem that we're having here, see how it says float64 does not name a type? Well, this actually knows what all that is, but it hadn't compiled that stuff yet. It was trying to compile a use source before it had compiled any of its other things. If I do that again, it should be fine. And I'm going to option click on the desktop. Here's my Tremol square go into the build folder, which is where we find the stuff that we've built. This stuff like start away, it was building this stuff too. It tried to build Tremble Square first without any of the stuff in this folder, and that's why it had a problem. And then when it tried a second time, it had the stuff built and it was ready to go. And now I have Tremble Square dot component. I can put it in here. I can fire up Twisted Wave. And it's literally not going to matter what I open because it's just replacing the input with something else. So this doesn't matter. All that matters is going to Air Windows and Tremel Square, ST, here we go. And loud noise. We've just made a oscillator. And the dry wet works too. 
but this is too high a frequency to be a tremolo. So let's fix that. Remember how I said I wasn't doing anything with this yet? Increment equals get parameter at k param 1, which is 0 to 1, times overall scale, which makes it 0 to whatever. Like if it's 96k, it's going to be a larger number. And actually, you know, the thing about that is I got that backwards. Can you see what I did wrong here? I'll tell you. If increment is making something happen, and I want it to be the same at different sample rates, and get parameter k param 1 is like 0 0.1. So every sample, we're going forwards by 0 0.1 until we loop and repeat it again. And then we multiply it by overall scale. Overall scale, the 96k would be something like a little over 2. And that would make increment go faster, not slower. If we want the same frequency, we want that to go slower. So we're going to be going divided by overall scale. But not necessarily just only that, because our frequency was very high. It was aliasing, but it was also very high. So what we want is like... A very big number and then that big number gets even bigger if we're at a high sample rate. I can also put the point zero in there so that it knows that it's a floating point number of some kind. Now we have increment and it goes from zero to one but it's zero to one divided by a very big number that should make the frequency go lower. And we drag it in, replace the old one. Since this is an old version of macOS, I can actually use this. Let's just open up a smaller file. I do have to relaunch the program every time, though. And recent effects. Now it should be much lower frequency. In fact, that's so slow that that's all we get. So how about smaller than that? This is this is the process of a lot of this. 10 times faster, 100 times faster. And also we can make it exponential, which is relevant to this and the VST. Now, in the audio unit, you can tell the audio unit to have its parameter be a, a logarithmic curve. So it'll be a really small number for most of it, and then it'll become a much larger number. In VST, I don't have that. So I'm not using it in this audio unit either. Instead, I'm going to do it here. Increment pal get prime one comma two. That means these small numbers we're doing a power, so it's 0.1 times 0.1, or 0.5 times 0.5, or 0.7 times 0.7, or 1 times 1. That's going to make it more of a curve. And I've also increased the frequency quite a bit. So, and this is a way of scaling the response of the control, which is very important with this kind of thing. So I've gone from like 10,000 to 100, and I've added this. Relaunch the program. Thankfully, since this is Snow Leopard, I don't actually have to reboot the computer to get the new plugin to show up. And here's our new frequencies. Zero, it's not moving. These tiny numbers, it's very small. And there's a new frequency. Now let's see about making this become a tremolo. Because we've got OSC now 
going from zero to one. What we can do about this is either do a duty cycle, and there's the thought, we could do a duty cycle. We could have the square be not only a tremolo, but also pulse width modulation. And we do that by handling, mind you, in order to do that, we'd also have to add another control. We can do that, but it would be more, it would have been better to have the other control there from the beginning because it's time consuming to put one in, but I can do it. For now, square wave. So what we're doing is taking a logic calculation, which is going to give us a true or false and reading it as a let's read it as an integer which would mean it'll be a one or a zero and let's see whether it'll let us do this i bet it will yep seems to have now if my calculations are correct although this is a stupid hack it will give me my tremolo but not the one that's zero crossing So, let's see, run this again. In this case, I am going to need to pull in audio because now it matters. And we have a square wave treble O. but it's not zero crossing. And the reason this is working is because we have our oscillator value going from zero to one. And now you put sample times equals, and this just says oscillator is greater than 0 0.5. Now it's gonna go from zero to one, so half the time it's going to be true and we're considering that to be an integer, so integer true is probably going to count as one. Now, and if there's some formulation where integer true winds up being something else, then we'd have a weird result. Like maybe it would distort stuff crazily, so we don't normally do this. I've demonstrated that it does what I think, but this is messy. So normally what you would do is something a little bit more direct, like So we take that away That'll do the same thing. Uh, there's no point C in the audio yet because it's nothing but either the original audio or silence. That's all the waveform looks like. There's nothing particularly interesting about that. I can, I can show you a bit, but basically what we're doing here is OS is still cycling. And this is doing the same thing as before. Instead of multiplying it by the integer value of a logic operation, which is going to be counting as zero if it's false. But if it's true, I don't think it's really necessarily the case that a value of true is always gonna be one. That's maybe not specified, so that's, that's dumb behavior that we don't necessarily want. Or, See, we've also got positive equals false. That is not necessarily the value that we want.
I'm going to challenge you to figure out why I did that. We got OSC, we got switched. So here, why did I call that switched? We know that OSC is changing, but what's going on is as soon as it's gone from one polarity to the other, and I may in fact need to keep track of that, as soon as it's gone from one polarity to the other, we're in theory going from silence to full volume or full volume to silence. That's not necessarily the same thing as turning the audio on or off. Instead, what we're going to do is we are going to keep track of the waveform and figure out whether it is positive, whether it has crossed zero. And we're also figuring out whether OSC has crossed zero. And the formulation that we're thinking of is as follows. OS cross 0 0.5 has cuz we're always going to wait a little bit Uh, Bo, if you wanted to have the signal going between negative 0 0.5 to 0 0.5, what you would do is go um, here's here's the problem. Let's let's take this out again. It was not really useful for me to try to do. I'm going to show you what you get. We'll build again. This is the same as it was before of us is incrementing and us is like this is our little it's always going to go up and then it will recycle again and it's going from one to zero. And this is where we calculate whether it's making stuff be silent or not. And I'll show you what it does. Put that in there. Yeah, it would have been subtracted. But the thing is, you're not going to... Your signal is not doing what you think it is. Let's zoom in here. And maybe find a bit where there's some bass or something. And here's the sound. So you got that going on. Now, if I apply this and play it, now that's vibrating at a thing. You might think that that is causing a signal pulsing between 0 0.5, but this is an amplitude modulation. So what you get is this. See that? Either the waveform is there or it's not. It's a little blank space in between. That's what the tremolo does. The tremolo is replacing chunks of the waveform that was already there with just silence. So it's not that the signal will pulse between minus 0 0.5. The signal is already pulsing between minus and positive. We're just replacing it with silences. And that's what the amplitude modulation does. 
So you can continue to explore your thoughts around that. I'm going to quit out of there and not save because we don't need that in our sample audio. And we're going to fool with this a little bit more because what we're trying to do is get it to only switch on or off at the point that the audio would cross a sample. In order to do that, we need to be able to keep track of the polarity. So we're going to keep track of a couple of things. And I believe we can do this keeping relatively small numbers of variables. So we're going to call polarity here and say, yeah, that's going to be negative. We'll call false negative and true positive. So we're assuming that we're starting with a negative. Now, if the sample is actually at zero, it's neither of those things. So maybe we'll include positive as part of zero or something. But now what we can do is go like here's our little oscillator code as before. So now we have a thing where we are taking the value of oscillator is less than 0 0.5 and giving it to a variable. And this is going to do the same thing that we did before. We just moved it out of the space. We're probably not going to stick with that, but that's because we have to start working on another thing now, polarity. We're defining another thing. We're defining it each sample. And we're going to go. Uh, I mean, that might have been correct. We'll see how this rolls. Um, so I'm doing this on the fly, and I'm talking through the process while I'm at it. So that's going to slow me down to some extent. Uh, polarity. So what that's doing is we're looking at input sample and if polarity is equal to input sample is less than zero. Actually, let's rephrase that. If input sample is less than zero, Polarity equals false. That's the same as what we've already got here. But here's the deal is we might want to do more than one thing in here. So So we can we can make polarity be a different value, or we can keep track of whether it's the same thing. Because you'll notice we've got it saved, right? Polarity is false. We're assuming that it's going to be less than zero. If it's not, 
less than zero. Right now what we're doing is we're just assigning that it will it will not pay any attention to whether waveforms spend more time on one side than another. If we are going to use polarity in this way, here's what happens. All the time that polarity is less than zero, like it already is, right? It starts out as less than zero. Then for all the buffer that we're doing, all the calculation we're doing, the entire time that it's on that negative swing, it's saying less than zero. Okay, so polarity is less than zero, fine. We knew that already. And if the input sample is greater than zero, then it's going to go here. It's going to set polarity to true. But check this out. Now we have a bit of code that can check for, did we just transition from one thing to another? And that is where this stuff starts to work. I will also note that uh, my AD clip code uses stuff like this. You wind up making these little stacks of stuff where, here, let's leave space in here so that we can see what's going on. So the way this works is we now have a little space in here. The code in here only runs if we just crossed over and then it stops doing anything anymore. I'm going to tidy this up a little bit. So now this area in here is the area of interest. And I feel like I've got, yeah, I've got switched to find up here as well. So we don't, in fact, I've done this wrong. See the, see the bug there? I've defined that in globals, it persists, but then I'm also defining it here, that's not correct. We're gonna be doing something else with it. So we got our little oscillator code. All of this is still taking up a relatively small amount of space. We've defined a mute here, which is whether we're going to mute or not. And that's going to follow similar rules. So in fact, I think I need yet another uh, I'm not positive I might have that wrong if I if I have it wrong I'll tell you one of these might prove unuseful possibly switched. I might have just made switched irrelevant. So we've got OSC that is going from 0 to 1 and I can define that it is less than 0 0.5. So here's the thing. This part will work. If mute, then input sample equals zero. We're keeping mute around from buffer to buffer, from sample to sample. But we're checking on, uh, we've got OSC happening constantly. So 
we could try just constantly, there's a number of things we can do, and here's one of them. What we can do is every time we cross zero, that's when we look up what OSC means, like whether OSC is greater or less than, than 0 0.5. And if we do that, we're going to duplicate this in two places, but it's going to be the same code. And there are some, th I'll talk you through another little deal, which is um, sometimes if people have pieces of code that are in two places, they're like, oh, we need to write a special subroutine. And you call the did this switch subroutine and put that somewhere else, like down here or somewhere. I find that to often be um, unhelpful because it's just making additional overhead. Now you have to make an additional stack trace for running a new subroutine, passing variables to it, getting them back. So I'd rather just do this manually in both places. And here's how that's going to happen. If ask slurt is less than 3.5, I can phrase it either way. That expression should give us our polarity switch. The thing is, it's only going to ask that question while we're switching from positive to negative. But if OSC is going really slowly, so it's constantly sticking around like above 0 0.5, that means leave the audio on. That means every time the sample goes from one polarity to another and crosses zero, it'll keep asking that question, but it'll keep getting the same answer. Mute stays persistent until the sample crosses and it gets to this point in the code where we have found that we've just swapped polarity. The input sample is less, but polarity was true, so we run this. Or the input sample was negative, but polarity was false, so... Uh, Hang on, let's have another look at this. If the input sample is positive, we run this stuff because it's else. But that's positive, but the polarity was false, therefore we run the code. And it's going to be the same each way. And we may be done. Let's have a look. I'm removing some of this base so that I can see it laid out the way it's supposed to be. These are such small statements that I'm not putting the brackets in. Normally what you do if you had multiple things to do is put brackets in so you could put multiple statements in there. But I only need one statement because I'm not changing OSC at all. That remains consistent regardless. And it doesn't matter whether I'm crossing the zero in one direction or another. I'm still only checking for one thing. So this part is checking the zero cross. And when we have just zero crossed is when we run this question. And this is the only place that we update mute. And if mute, we silence everything. So what we've got here I might even be able to make this a single statement. I'm not sure how that would work. I assume that it would. Let's see how this goes. If it builds and works, then I was right and it worked. It's a kind of uh, messy way of stating it, but since I'm not using those brackets, you can kind of do that. If you were using the brackets, it would start looking 
like this, where you can see where the blocks of code sit. When you, when you mess stuff up in that way, it's called obfuscating code. So this is an attempt to make the code look sensible. In fact, let me put it back. We'll often have ifs and elses and things on the same indent to see where they are. So build. And if I'm not mistaken, as it happens, I did not actually need switched because of the reason I explained. Oh, hang on. Show me trimmer skirt H. We don't need this. So we needed these things. And now if we do this and drag this to components, open up a track. We will walk through this. It's getting on towards one o'clock, one o'clock, so I'm just about finished, but I think we have successfully done this one. Expand this out. I'll fire up Terminal Square, and now it sounds like this. That is a square wave tremolo that only switches on zero crossings. And let's get back our selection. Pick a nice handy spot. Oh, that didn't, that's not what I wanted at all. Uh, no matter. I'll find something. Looking for a nice base note here where we can show how that works. And Trimble Square, and I'll show you what that looks like. Somewhat limited by the fact that it's a bass note, so it's not changing very often. But if we do that very high speed one, actually maybe that's too high of a speed to see. And apply that. We're getting some weird dropouts, so maybe that's not so desirable. Let's undo that and do it over. I mean to show you what this looks like as a function. So. There's our tremolo. And that's what it looks like. As you can see, it's cutting these ones more tightly because it's a higher frequency sound, so it's more granularity there. But these ones are only switching as the sample hits zero. And you can see that on something like this guy here. And you can also see that they don't match. Like it was closer, the transition here was the same for this one. But over here, I guess the transition was different for each of these. And so it stretched out farther this way. And so these two didn't uh, transition at exactly the same time. And lastly, it is one o'clock, so I'm about ready to head out. But before we do that, let us take a moment to dial in. Oh, didn't mean to do that. You stop. Let's dial in the speed.
Actually, that might be too much. Four. This should make it so that I have a wider range of uh, tremolo-like square waves, but then as I push it all the way up to one, it starts to go up into the silly high frequency range. And then I can adjust the remains of that by fiddling with this number 50, if it's not a high enough note for me. We'll build that. Replace it. Fire up my track again. Go to a different one this time. And Trumbull Square is now like this. Good and slow. It's a little faster. Dry wet. That's clean. The interesting thing about this um, zero crossing thing is that Let's find a different spot. Let's go back to the other one. Here's what the track sounds like. Like since this is, these are higher frequencies, you can hear it easier. And as we go up in pitch, we're getting less of a grindy overtone because the speed at which we're the the actual frequency of the oscillator is now aliasing by where the zero crosses are so it sounds kind of grungy and garbagey And at a speed this high, it's almost random. It's every zero cross, it is muting or not muting on an almost random basis. So that works pretty good. And at a lower speed, of course, you're getting a nice clean... Uh, on and off switch. If you were using the non-zero crossing version, you get more of a note out of the higher frequencies. It's overriding the frequency of the oscillator because it's only checking at each zero cross. Let's get to another sound. That's aggressive. In fact, let's stop this. And let's find something that's hissy. So that's an aggressive sound. Let's just dub that and see whether we get a more interesting effect out of the tremolo square on that one. Like obviously it's a slow tremolo. It does something, but can we hear the frequency of it better?
kind of. So as a final test, we'll close this and open a noise track. So since this is noise and it's high frequency white noise, in this case, we can take frequency and turn it way up and still hear more or less the note. But since it's zero cross based, you're still not really picking up the note up all that well. Because the randomness is kind of dithering the offsets. And there you have it. So, you can expect that plugin, not next week, but it's coming. I'll put it in the next couple of weeks. Again, if, if people really desperately want one of these things I've just done, then you can clamor for it, and maybe it'll start becoming just coding stuff and then immediately needing to put it out. I'm not sure quite how that'll go. I guess we'll see. But uh, that is a plugin the uh, Tremolo Square plugin that is the zero crossing square wave tremolo coded from scratch while you watched. So hopefully that was cool for folks. My, and you'll notice that uh, one of the challenges I face is that when I'm looking at OBS and looking at my face on the screen, I'm always looking at that rather than looking at you. I got to work on that stuff. But that's how we roll. So uh, we live and learn, I guess. Anywho, this has been our Q&A session, and I hope you enjoyed it. Next week, we'll do something else. I guess I can cross this one off of our list, and you'll be seeing it as a plugin in AU and uh, several different kinds of VST before very long. Uh, if you super, super badly need this one, then bug me about it, and maybe I can bump it ahead or whatever. I have not ported it to VST, but it should be fairly straightforward to do. And uh, I don't foresee a problem with that. So I'll just I'll just grind away and do that one. And as you can see, it's a very simple, it fits on one screen of space. It's a very simple plugin, but it does its job pretty nicely. On that note... Talk to y'all later. Bye-bye. Oh, and by later, what I mean is I'll be back at three. I'll be back in two hours doing music and talking to you folks about that. For anybody who would like to catch up with that, just saying. So give me in a couple of hours to like half lunch or whatever. And yeah, I'm doing the music streaming again. But... I'll have this wired up, and I'll be talking to folks before I get it rolling. And we'll see what that becomes. Maybe that'll become something interesting. At any rate, I've decided that I'm going to do it, so I'll see you in a couple of hours, maybe, if anybody wants to check it out. And I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.